uh, thank you for coming tonight. We're going to be hearing a very interesting presentation on all the work that's been going on at Shubal Pond. Uh, I want to say before I start any more comments that this meeting is being recorded uh, for Channel 18, just so you know that anything you might say will be uh, kept for posterity. So I really don't have much more else to say tonight except to uh, introduce Amr Anru, who has been the senior project manager and has been leading this effort. And uh, you can introduce any other teammates that are here. Okay. Great, yeah, thank you. Right. Thank you, Paula. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for attending tonight. Uh, with me today, I have our consultants who worked on this project. Dr. Brian Howes uh, in the blue shirt. Next to him on the left is Ed Eichner. Uh, they're the main consultants for this project. And then in the back there, we also have uh, town engineer Griffin Bowden. Um, some of you may know him very well because he's been giving a lot of presentations on our comprehensive wastewater management plan. Um, and before I go any further, I just want to check that everyone in this room can hear me well. We're good? And if, speak up if you can't. Um, all right, so we're good. Uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll continue on with the presentation that I've prepared for you all today. Um, you know, it should take me anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes to move through these slides, and at the end we'll have time for discussion and questions. Um, so, thank you again for uh, showing up today for the presentation on the Shubal Pond Diagnostic Nutrient Assessment and Management Plan. So, just to get started, I want to kind of look at the town of Barnstable more broadly. Um, in this town, we have many lakes and ponds, somewhere plus or minus 180 ponds in total in this town. And of the 180 ponds that we have here, 25 of those ponds are designated as a great pond because they are greater than 10 acres in size. Um, and that's a designation that we get from the state. We actually, surprisingly, uh, have a lot, of, a lot of background data on these ponds that was collected through the Ponds and Lakes Stewardship Program, which started back in 2001. And for certain ponds has, you know, continued annually by collecting samples in August and September, and for some ponds, uh, less frequent. But through that data collection, we are able to understand that unfortunately, in a way, most of these great ponds are actually impaired to some degree. Um, but we don't, through that data, through that monitoring, we don't actually understand exactly what is causing the impairment. And you know, one thing that we decided to do uh, to better understand how to manage um, ponds and lakes in the town of Barnstable was to develop the Pond and Lake Management Plan Program, which was initiated in early 2020. And through the development of that program, um, we, we decided to prioritize the ponds that we had available data for, and Shubal Pond was at the top of that list, which is why we pursued this, this diagnostic study and the management plan for Shubal Pond. So to get into more details regarding Shubal Pond, this is a 55-acre pond. So the surface area of the pond is 55 acres. It has a maximum depth of around 13 meters. This pond is tr uh, stocked in both the spring and the fall with trout. Um, some of you in here may be trout fishermen uh, or, or like to enjoy eating trout. Um, and that's actually a nice thing about Shubal Pond because only four of our ponds in this town are stocked with trout. So it's not as though that all of them have this feature. Uh, we also have two boat ramps at this site. One is a public boat ramp off of Willimantic Drive. Uh, and I have a pointer here. There's Willimantic Drive. And we have another boat ramp that's, uh, you know, more localized to the community over here in Lakeside Drive uh, that's used over there. We have uh, four beaches. One is a public beach near Willimantic Drive. We have uh, three more semi-public beaches located around the pond off of uh, the Evergreen Community, uh, Lakeside Drive, and the Fair Acres Daycare Center uh, on the pond. There's also a town way of water that can be accessed via Shubal Pond Road. Uh, this is an old road, there are no houses on it, so you would have to walk the path to get down there. So why are we looking at Shubal Pond? Well, 
Shuvu Pond has been monitored annually since roughly 2009 for cyanobacteria. And prior to 2018, there were no cyanobacteria blooms in this pond. Uh, it was just a, one of those oligotrophic, which means very clear, low nutrient containing uh, kettle hole ponds that was enjoyed by many. In 2018, we experienced our first very significant bloom. Uh, this photo on the left with the very green water is a cyanobacteria bloom that appeared in early October in 2018. In 2019 and 2020, we also had cyanobacteria blooms, all of which uh, the health division posted uh, public health advisories warning people to not interact with the pond water. This was very concerning, you know, to I think all of you and, and others in the town of why now, why is Shubal Pond experiencing these cyanobacteria blooms? And so, in an effort to understand why, uh, the DPW's approach to that would be to take a systematic and science-based approach to target effective management in this pond. And by systematic, I mean, you know, going through the development of the Ponds and Lakes program, prioritizing our ponds in town for which ones we should uh, start assessing first and developing these pond and lake management plans, and then science-based approach by hiring scientists to take a comprehensive, holistic look at the pond and exactly what um, is in causing the impairment in the pond and the sources that are related to that impairment so that we can take a targeted approach at that. And so this, this study was initiated in May of 2020 and that began the first year of a two year um, process to get to where we are today. And the first year was the nutrient diagnostic assessment where they uh, assessed dissolved oxygen and temperature throughout the water column in, in Shubal Pond. They looked at uh, water column nitrogen, phosphorus, chlorophyll A pigments, pH and alkalinity throughout the, the water column. And for those of you who don't know, um, chlorophyll A is, if you ever see a pond that looks really green, it's gonna have higher chlorophyll A pigments in it. Uh, chlorophyll is uh, a sign of phytoplankton blooms in the pond. It also includes cyanobacteria, but it does not distinguish between the two. So because it doesn't distinguish between the two, we also did phytoplankton composition sampling to assess which, uh, you know, of the algae that's in the pond, what's good algae and what's bad algae, the blue-greens or the, the cyanobacteria in the pond. Um, the SMAST also collected sediments from, from the, within the pond to assess nutrients that are regenerated from those sediments under anoxic, low oxygen conditions. Uh, they also looked at the watershed to see what septic systems were potentially inputting nutrients to the pond. They looked at the stormwater entry points around the pond, monitored those for nutrient inputs, and also did an assessment of what runoff might be coming into the pond from, surround, from the surrounding area. Um, once they had all that information, they, they digested it down you know, into the 100 page report some of you may or may not have read, um, but then also added you know, basically what nutrient targets are we trying to achieve to, um, to manage Shubal Pond for better water quality conditions, in particular uh, not having cyanobacteria blooms. And, in developing those uh, nutrient reduction targets, they also provided uh, management options to meet those targets. So to start to get into the findings of the report, what that monitoring really tells us about Shubal Pond, um, we, we can look at basically this, this figure here, which if you imagine looking at Shubal Pond, you see the surface of the pond as you look out across it. Um, this, if you could divide the pond in half at the deepest location, this would be a cross section of Shubal Pond with the surface being on the top and the bottom, you know, on the, on the left here we have depth in meters, so we're moving towards the bottom. The bottom of the pond roughly around 13 meters depth. Um, everything in blue here in early May is well oxygenated. Um, a lot of that is because we're coming out of winter, everything's been very cold, and uh, the, the water column can mix from top to bottom. And at that time of year, with the good oxygen conditions and cold temperatures, 
all of Shubal Pond is suitable for, for cold water fisheries. So those trout that are, are stocked in the pond every spring, they can use any section of the pond they would like. Uh, also, phosphorus and nitrogen conditions in the pond at that time of, of year are pretty similar throughout the entire water column. As we move into summer and things start to warm up in May and, and into June, stratification develops at some point in the water column. And what they found in the, the mo monitoring was that stratification was developing around the four meters uh, down from the surface, which means that this upper water column is a warm water zone. So warm water fishery fish will like to um, you know, exist up here in this warm water. Uh, this water section of the pond is also well mixed and well oxygenated. It also has the lowest phosphorus concentrations of the pond. As you move deeper in the water column, you still have good oxygen levels below that area of stratification, um, but you have a smaller area of cold water. So your habitat for, for that cold water fishery is, is pretty reduced compared to where it was in May. And as you move deeper, you have decreasing oxygen availability. And eventually, the oxygen in this uh, orangish area drops below the state standard for cold water fisheries, which is set at six milligrams per liter. And at the very bottom, this red area, there's no oxygen at all. And when you get the conditions of no oxygen in the water column, you start to get increased release of nitrogen and phosphorus from those sediments, which is what's causing the increasing phosphorus uh, concentrations in the water column above it. By mid-August, the warmest part of summer, stratification has been, you know, in place for almost two months now. And that means that, sorry, uh, it means that this bottom water is not mixing with the surface water. The surface water is interacting with the atmosphere. That's why we're still maintaining a well-mixed, well-oxygenated, low-phosphorus condition in the, the upper water column of Shubal Pond. But as you get below that zone of stratification, you can see that we've lost all habitat for cold water fishery in August because now this water is too warm for them and there's not enough oxygen in the waters that are cold enough for them. So for instance, there's probably cold water down here, but they're going to be stressed by the low oxygen conditions. And because this water is not mixing with the atmosphere, at around eight meters and down, all of that water has no oxygen in it, which means that you have a pretty significant portion of the pond bottom that's releasing nitrogen and phosphorus back into the water column above it. Things start to cool down after September, and by late October, we see that the stratification in the upper water column breaks down. And that means that the portion of water column below that, so for instance, you can see stratification is down at around 10 meters here. That means that all this portion of the water column with the additional nitrogen and phosphorus has now mixed up into the upper portion of the water column, which is adding nutrients to it. So in some years, such as 2018, depending on how much uh, nitrogen and phosphorus is built up in these bottom sediments, you are more likely to see those late season cyanobacteria blooms at that time of year. And that all depends on every year is different at the rate at which the stratification breaks down and releases those nutrients into the water column. If stratification breaks down slowly over time, so a little bit at a time, you may not see a bloom occur. But if it breaks down a lot at once, a bloom may occur. Um, nonetheless, in October, we have cooler temperatures, good oxygen in the upper water column. This is suitable for the cold water fishery. Um, and there's still a little bit of anoxia at the bottom of the pond where there's still some excess nitrogen and phosphorus being released from those anoxic sediments. Now, why am I telling you about the oxygen conditions in Shubal Pond and nitrogen and phosphorus released from the sediments? Well, cyanobacteria are fed by nutrients, such as nitrogen and phosphorus. So it's important that we understand the dynamics, the oxygen temperature dynamics of the pond, and how that relates to nitrogen and phosphorus in the water column. Well, one thing that's important in terms of managing 
any water body, especially for cyanobacteria, is to understand what nutrient you're targeting for uh, management. And in order to do that, you want to look at your nitrogen and phosphorus ratios in the pond. So um, the, the magic number for nitrogen and phosphorus ratios in determining if it's a phosphorus limited system or a nitrogen limited system is anything over 16 is a phosphorus limited system. Anything below 16 is a nitrogen limited system. In fresh water systems, they tend to be phosphorus limited, and in the case of Shubal Pond, it is phosphorus limited. And we know that because looking at all these various lines on this chart, uh, which all indicate uh, multiple sampling depths, half meter, three meter, seven meter, nine meter, and one meter off the bottom is that deep sampling uh, location. All of, these, all of these sampling depths at all times of the year in 2020 it was above 16, meaning that this pond is phosphorus limited and in order to manage water quality, we need to manage for phosphorus. So what are the phosphorus concentrations in Shubal Pond? Well, and, and what do we need to manage to, right, in order to improve water quality in this pond? Well, the, the limit for Shubal Pond in terms of phosphorus and having the best water quality that, that would be um, resilient against cyanobacteria is you need to manage the pond to have water quality below this threshold of 10 micrograms per liter. And in 2020, you can see that at all those sampling depths, pretty much every time, the, the, the concentration of phosphorus is above that 10 micrograms per liter. Now, it doesn't mean that you are definitely going to have a cyanobacteria bloom. It just makes you more prone to algae, even good algae. So that reduces your water clarity in the pond, um, which is you know, not always something we like is when you have poor water clarity. Um, but it, it really makes you more susceptible to experiencing a cyanobacteria bloom. And one more thing to point out here is that you can see that for at least the depths of a half meter, three meter, seven meter, and nine meter, these lines in here, the phosphorus concentration you know, it goes up and down through the summer. Um, but it's largely between 10 and 20 micrograms per liter. But that bottom most sample has a lot more phosphorus in it in the, in the middle of the summer, those August, September uh, samplings. And that's where we're getting the most amount of phosphorus released from those sediments. So we, we know we have a phosphorus problem because the phosphorus concentrations in the pond are above that limit of 10 micrograms per liter. So what sources are contributing to the pond's phosphorus concentration? What do we need to control for in order to improve water quality in Shubal Pond? Well, through the study and through SMAS, they looked at what the contributing sources were. And what they found was that septic systems within 300 feet of the pond and in the contributing groundwater shed, so the groundwater that actually moves into the pond, those are the homes that are contributing phosphorus to Shubal Pond. And those septic systems make up 59% of the load entering Shubal Pond. In addition, they looked at the sediments that were associated with those anaerobic conditions at the bottom of the pond. And they found that the phosphorus released from those sediments into Shubal Pond's water column were making up about 23% of the phosphorus load in the pond. In addition, we have natural atmospheric deposition that occurs. If ever you've noticed the dust builds up on your uh, car or the pollen in the springtime, that's natural as atmospheric deposition. And as that falls down onto the pond surface, it's also contributing to the phosphorus load in the pond. It's not a controllable phosphorus load, but nonetheless, it does contribute to the overall phosphorus budget of the pond. That's making up roughly 11% of of the phosphorus load in Shubal Pond. And then we have stormwater inputs. I know a lot of us have, uh, are intimately aware of the certain stormwater inputs that enter Shubal Pond, either through the Shubal Pond road pipe or down Willimantic Drive. Um, 
And, and those stormwater inputs were measured, and you know the volume of water coming through the pipe or, or down the roadway was, was assessed, and what we found is that uh, roughly 6% of the phosphorus load is coming from the stormwater systems. Um, so it's a measurable amount, but it, it is relatively small compared to sediments and septic systems. We also looked at overland runoff, just what's coming from you know, the, the area surrounding the pond and, and running overland and into the pond, and that makes up only 1% of the phosphorus load to Shubal Pond. So I, I mentioned that those septic systems, they're the largest load of phosphorus entering Shubal Pond, and it's the ones that are within 300 feet of the pond. Um, that are contributing to the pond and within the, the groundwater that actually moves into the pond. And so those homes are the ones outlined in red at the north side of the pond here. Those systems are the ones that are, are contributing phosphorus to, to the pond beca because they have septic systems and they've also been in place for many, many years. Um, so compared to nitrogen, which is, is not attenuated or captured in the sediments as, as it moves through the ground, uh, phosphorus can be attenuated in the sediments around your, your septic system leach field and on its way traveling to the pond. Um, and that slows down the travel time of phosphorus through ground into water bodies like Shubal Pond. Because these systems are all 20 plus years old, some much older, um, and they haven't been updated in recent years, at this point in time, they're contributing phosphorus to Shubal Pond. So how are we going to address the issue of excess phosphorus in Shubal Pond to help improve water quality and hopefully um, eliminate cyanobacteria blooms? Well, we have what we call long-term and short-term solutions. Because septic systems are part of the problem for this pond, we, are, we need to address that at some point in time. And for Shubal Pond, if we were to sewer those homes within 300 feet of the pond and remove the phosphorus load coming off of those septic systems, that would improve Shubal Pond water quality enough to reduce the phosphorus load below 10 milligrams per liter. And so um, as a result, you know, in discussions at the DPW, we said Shubal Pond is currently in phase three of the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan, which means that it would have received sewer in the years 20 to 30. Um, instead, we've, we've decided it should be moved up, you know, 10 years into phase two, which means that it would experience sewering within years 10 to 20, which is roughly 2030 to 2040. And the homes that would be changed from phase three, so on this map we have our phase one, phase two, phase three, and our various stages of, of sewering, and also some sewer areas. So sewered area is green, phase one sewer is red, phase two sewer is uh, green here, sorry, sewered is gray, um, and phase three is the yellow area here. The homes that would be moved up in phase two are outlined by this green line here. Um, so that's, a, that's the long-term plan, is to advance sewer to these homes so that we can improve water quality for Shubal Pond. But in the meantime, it'd be nice to improve water quality sooner than that. And so in the near term, we have options like an alum treatment uh, that could bind to the phosphorus at the bottom and the sediments being released below eight meters in the bottom area of the pond. And if we bind to the phosphorus being released from those sediments, that will reduce the overall phosphorus concentration in the pond and help prevent cyanobacteria blooms. But modeling suggests that that's not going to get us below the 10 microgram per liter threshold, which means that we're still going to be prone. There might be potential for cyanobacteria blooms. But what an alum treatment really helps to do here is set us back in time. So it wasn't until 2018 that we started getting these blooms in Shubal Pond. Um, if we can apply alum to these sediments at the bottom of the pond that are contributing phosphorus to the water column, we can hopefully set ourselves back in time enough to be in the pre-2018 conditions where we didn't experience those cyanobacteria blooms. 
Also, just so you know, that's a barge. Um, alum is, a, is in solution, and it's something that is deployed you know, just under the water column and specifically applied to the sediments that are deep, deep uh, in the pond. So it wouldn't be applied in the shallower sediments where it's not needed. Um, we don't want to apply it in, in areas that it's not necessary because although I didn't explain it before, these areas where we have uh, enough oxygen in the water column, so not anoxic, not very, very low, the sediments are actually absorbing a little bit of phosphorus into them. So adding alum to these sediments wouldn't do anything for us. Um, and that's why we'd be targeting the sediments at the bottom that experience that no oxygen condition at some point in the summer. Um, another thing that we can do to help reduce the overall phosphorus load to Shubal Pond is address the stormwater inputs. Um, so actually, as of this week, um, one of the sites, uh, this is a pipe that's connected to a catch basin off of Evergreen Drive. Uh, the town is actually installing additional leaching in the road there to help reduce stormwater flows through this pipe. Um, on the left here, this is a Shubal Pond stormwater pipe. Uh, that, that discharges the most amount of the stormwater to the pond. Uh, what we're proposing here is that we would install additional leaching uh, further up Shubal Pond Road to help capture the water and infiltrate it into the ground. And again, as that phosphorus binds to the sediments further up watershed, it's, it's not likely to reach the pond ever. So that would, that would help reduce the overall phosphorus load coming from these systems. In addition, um, the Association to Preserve Cape Cod was recently uh, funded with a grant opportunity to assess stormwater inputs at boat ramps. And so this site over here at the Shubal Pond boat ramp off of Willimantic Drive is one of the sites that they're assessing in our town for potential improvements in that area to reduce stormwater inputs coming off the roadway and down this boat ramp into Shubal Pond. So while we hope to address all of these in the near term, it, again makes up a very small portion of the total phosphorus load to Shubal Pond and it's not going to get us below that 10 micrograms per liter but this in concert with the alum are going to be the two measures we can implement in the near term to help reduce the available phosphorus for cyanobacteria blooms. Um, and in the meantime, and without further ado, uh, if you have any questions I'm happy to take those now or, or just discuss what's been presented here today. George. Amber, first of all, thank you. That was an impressive presentation. We're grateful for the speed with which you moved to address this. If you go back to the stormwater pipes, because I'm very familiar with both of those, uh, one of the middle, uh, I think you said, is from the Evergreen uh, neighborhood, I believe. Yes. Uh, and, uh, since I live very near that, I can tell you the construction crews have just put in uh, new. Uh, catch basins and, and leaching fields. Where does the water come for A, though? That's the one that comes down to Shubal Pond Road. That, where does that water come from? That is a great question. So um, off of Osterville, West Barnstable Road, um, just above R Race Lane, um, there is an inlet that allows water to come through it, it basically, uh, you know, it's like a ditch that captures a lot of storm water. And it allows the water to come in through to the storm water system and it's connected to this pipe. Um, if that inlet wasn't there, there'd be a lot of flooding on Osterville West Barnstable Road, which is potentially dangerous. Uh, at the same time, it does result in a lot more water inputs to Shubal Pond um, than if it was, you know, just a leaching structure or something like that. But there's a significant amount of water during rainstorms that comes into that ditch on the side of the road um, and then comes through this pipe. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Bill. Um, I, concerning your assumptions about 300 feet, houses that are within 300 feet, I'm not, I don't dispute that, but I guess I'm, interested in learning about that. Um, phosphorus moves slowly. So if you put a house with a leach field that's 250 feet away, I'm just saying, as an example, and it's a new house, right? Right. That's going to take 
and I don't remember what the number was, but it was something like one or two or three feet per year or something. Is that? It'll take 25 minutes. Okay, so, so it takes some time. Yeah. So, so your 300 is based on some calculation that says, hey, these houses are all 25, 30 years old, running it. Yeah, so um, I, I think at this point, I, I'd like to turn that technical question over to Ed. Uh, I mean, I, I read the report, I, I understand it as well, but he can probably explain that a lot better than I can. Yeah. So when we looked, well, we looked at all the houses. We looked at all of the septic systems. We looked at the ages of the septic systems and we looked at the distance from the, uh, the leach fields to the edge of the pond. So we can look at, we know how fast uh, phosphorus generally moves. And what was the number? What did you say? It's how many feet per year? It's, well, it takes about 25 to 40 years 25 for it to go 300 feet. 25 years to go 300 feet. 25 to, to 40. 25 to 40. Okay. So that's what we're looking when we're, when we go through and we did this analysis, this, this map, and we point out the parcels that are actually contributing the phosphorus to the bond. We're looking at the ages of each of those septic systems and their distance, so we can get a good idea of whether they've actually okay. made it all the way to the pond. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, can I follow that up a little bit? Uh, so I would have thought that any septic system north of the pond, the stormwater, the groundwater is coming north to south towards the correct uh, ocean. Why aren't all the houses north of the pond over time reaching down to the pond? They take them longer or farther away. Are, they, are the phosphates being degraded because of the distance? Is that yes. what's happening? So when we go through and we do this kind of balance, we're trying to get to a point where we've actually got a balance between what we're estimating coming in from the watershed and what we're actually measuring in the pond itself. And so we're looking at all of those properties. We're looking at you know, the travel times of phosphorus and everything else, the ages of those properties. <clears throat> and so this, what we've got here, those properties that we've got, balances out with what we actually see in the water column. So eventually, those properties well beyond those are eventually going to make it. But the question is, are you going to have the same leach field 25 to 30 years or 40 years from when those properties are, are beyond 300 feet, are they actually going to impact the pond? In all likelihood, you're probably going to replace your leach field before they get to the pond. And that's going to start the whole cycle over again in terms of phosphorus getting it there. So it's good, it, that is a good planning way to look at it. It balances out with what we see in terms of measurements in the water. Here, I'm still a little confused. I'll just follow up one more time. So, if somebody's got a house half a mile north, right? That they've had for 100 years, right? <laughs> or 50 years, whatever it may be. Hasn't their phosphate been sort of slowly reaching down? It, it, it's making its way towards the pond. It's the question of whether it's going to get there or not. There aren't that many houses that are that old in here. There may only be like one or two, as a matter of fact. Um, most of these houses, we go through and we do that looking at the ages and everything else. Most of them are in the probably 20 to 30 year old range. Um, and that's a lot of what we're seeing in terms of the water quality. Amber was talking about starting to see the, the, the phytoplankton blooms and those sorts of things. Phosphorus takes a while. It's taking that 20 to 30 years to get to the pond. What you're starting to see in the pond is that breakout of all those decades worth of phosphorus finally making it all the way. I can say the point on that. The, the graphic that Amber showed on the story that would come in phase two does go well above the pond. So and the fear always is, of course, that those will eventually get there. But this will take care of not just the 30 years zone, but maybe the 100 years more zone. 
Yeah, I'll add to that too. The reason why that area is larger than just the area directly on the pond is we're also concerned about nitrogen and coastal invaders. So we're worried about phosphorus in, in the pond, but the nitrogen travels quickly actually, and it makes its way to the embankment. So we need to sewer those areas uh, to deal with nitrogen, but also phosphorus now we're learning for the properties that are really close. So that's why the area is bigger, and that's why that whole area is proposed to be sewered to begin with. Um, when we come up there with the infrastructure, we're going to do the area. We're not just going to come in and do the handful of properties um, that are directly in, uh, affecting the bond. That's what sense to uh, do a project in that manner. So we would do the, the region, for lack of better terms, at that time. Can I go the other direction? Within the 300 feet, are there any of the systems that are only 150 feet away? It's going to take half as many years to get there? Yeah. If, if if you go back to that. So we looked at instead of 25, <laughs> so all of these, they're contributing right now, anything that's in green. Um, we looked at these over here, you'll see these darker green ones, those haven't gotten that. So the, there's a distinction, we went through, we looked at all of those. Some of them are much younger, and it, if you replace the septic, if you replace your leach field, you're starting the, the clock all over again. You won't get there. Is the dotted line 300 feet? The, uh, this is 300 feet, this pink dotted line. Now, 300 feet is not a magic number. That's based on a, a foot per day worth of groundwater flow. If you're in a situation where groundwater travels slower or faster, it's going to be different than 300 feet. And I can see the, the map of the house, and it looks like the driveway. Is, is the actual septic location? Located on that? No. So the houses are in gray, driveways are in orange. Um, I actually didn't put those. Okay. But they could be closer to the pond, is it possible? Generally, they would be. Um, generally, it depends. You know, it depends on layout, how you how you do your layout of your development on your property. The, it happens that most of this is on the north side. But that has nothing to do with it flowing south in general. It just happens to be that's where the homes are. That's right. The, that watershed comes in from the north and, and flows out towards the south. Go ahead. The Evergreen Homeowners Association. Um, and a lot of what you're presenting here is very consistent with what you represented at our annual meeting, which was very easy for the, the, the association members to get their hands around. Um, and Paul, thank you for your contribution to that as well. Um, but I'm a little confused as to what role um, Barthol. Uh, Clearwater uh, Initiative has I know you were at the same meeting I was at uh, last week when they had a presentation. What is their initiative relative to what the town is doing? Are they working together? So the Barnesville Clean Water Coalition is currently working in the Sand Shores neighborhood or the area of Lakeside Drive at, on I think it's something like 14 homes in this area roughly and they're they're implementing enhanced nitrogen reducing septic systems and what they are finding you know at least through the work that the EPA and USGS is doing in this area uh, is that the groundwater is moving from Shubal Pond through uh, those homes in this direction towards the three bays estuary way 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 down here and and so that project you know, they have been keeping us in the loop on it, letting us know about what they're finding, in particular the, the way the groundwater was moving in this area. And um, we, we did take that into consideration as part of the study. So yes, we were working with them and discussing with them through the process of developing this management plan. But when it comes to implementation, I mean, that's totally on the town. But isn't that opposite of what you're saying? You're saying it's going from north to south, and now they're saying it's going... So, Groundwater moves in a lot of interesting ways. As part of their study, they had monitoring wells all throughout this area and then a, a couple up here in the Willimantic area. And based on those wells, they were like, groundwater from here is moving into the pond, then mm -hmm. along this area it moves into the pond, and then it comes out of the pond this direction. Um, so, so that was the findings that they were able to provide to us. So those 14 new systems Right. As I understand it, they're removing nitrogen and not phosphates. Correct. That would have effect on the Correct. Uh, they are 
analyzing you know, the, the uh, nutrient removal uh, for both the nitrogen and phosphorus in those se septic systems just to see if maybe the system also removes phosphorus. Uh, that would be an interesting finding. So they are looking at that, but at this time, um, we don't know if they're going to be phosphorus reducing systems as well. So their focus is exclusively on the three bays, not necessarily what we're going through with um, I mean, I don't... Yeah, that would be an ancillary finding. that these homes were going to be contributing to shubal bonds. Um, but the findings of the EPA was that the groundwater is actually moving in a different direction from that neighborhood, which was, which was an interesting finding, I think, for all of us, frankly. We didn't expect that. Um, so what, what, what is the result of that? That means it's basically going towards, towards the three days. And frankly, that means removing nitrogen is good because we need to remove nitrogen within the three-day watershed. Um, the pond actually does a good job of losing, removing nitrogen when nitrogen is introduced to the pond. It was something on the order of 80%. Yes. So 80% of the nitrogen encountered through the pond is actually removed. So in effect, the pond is a treatment method for nitrogen for us. And it doesn't really doesn't impact the pond, but the phosphorus does from those close homes that are getting there. Um, so what, what the Washington Clean Water Coalition is doing is, is great work. And what they're doing is they're they're getting additional data on a system that has the potential to be a solution um, at some level of scale for the region um, to help remove nitrogen. They happen to pick this area to do that pilot project. Um, and you know, it just so happened that we found the groundwater was actually going in a different direction and that wasn't really anticipated or known before the project started. Does that, does that help answer your question? Yes, thank you. George. Sorry, forgive me for multiple questions. If we're on the, the, the ultimate solution here is if we're studying the sewer lines, right, that removes the leaching from the septic systems. In this case, if we're in phase two, at the earliest, that begins 10 years out, but it's anywhere between 10 and 20, depending on when you get there. And for those of us who have worked in government and know it and admire it, it doesn't always move in a timely fashion. So it could be quite some time before we're hooked up to the sewer lines. Is there anybody looking into the prospect of taking C. Crocker's idea of a, uh, a new septic system that takes nitrogen? And as I understand, those can also be a phosphate reducing component. Mm -hmm. And simply, town all purchasing phosphate limiting components and making them available to the homeowners. I know that's maybe science fiction, but I just Well it it is thought. private property, so uh, we couldn't we couldn't, you know, pay for things that go on but private I've done property. It on basis, right? right. Um, and yes there are actually uh, phosphorus reducing septic systems that are in the piloting stage. So for instance, the nitrogen, enhanced nitrogen reducing systems that the Barnstable Clean Water Coalition is working with are in the provisionally approved stage under DEP. Um, so it goes piloting, provisional, and then basically approved, generally approved systems. Um, you want to get to the generally approved system to start implementing them widely. Anything under that, they're heavily monitored for you know, their actual effectiveness at reducing nitrogen or in the case of phosphorus reducing systems, their effectiveness at reducing phosphorus. There are currently four systems at that first, in the first phase of approvals which are being piloted, which means that the manufacturer says, hey, this system can remove this much phosphorus, achieving this level of reduction, and the effluent is you know, below some, some amount of phosphorus. Those are in the really early stages, and in terms of Shubal Pond and implementing those systems in this area, they may not be enough to get us below the 10 micrograms per liter. They can reduce the phosphorus load and, and maybe get you close. If they're better than the manufacturer says they are, might get you below 10. But at this time, it's really hard to, 
to indicate whether or not they would be effective for Shubal Pond. So if anyone is interested in trying those systems out, MassTech, the, the Septic S System Test Center, has a grant opportunity right now uh, where I think if you want to implement one of these piloted in phosphorus reducing systems, you can get five grand towards uh, implementation of a system on your property. Um, but so it is possible to do that. It just, it may not achieve the goals for this pond. Thank you. Amy. Uh, if people can make the good stewards of their septic system, they get them inspected, pumped every two to three years, if they use phosphorus to be cleaners, if they don't use their garbage disposal, they don't flush chemicals, and all those things that they tell consumers, it, would that have any impact, do you think? So pumping your septic system doesn't stop water from flowing through it, which continues to push that phosphorus down through the ground towards the pond. Um, you would need to install something like a tight tank where the water can't leave the system, but then you'd have to have it pumped a lot more frequently. Um, so yes, phos low phosphorus, no phosphorus detergents and products are better. Um, however, mo we have actually in mass general law, it, there's a regulation that we can't even really buy those products. Um, if you look through your household products, you will be hard pressed to find one that has phosphorus in it. Um, I actually looked through mine, only my toothpaste, so. <laughs> I did the same thing, so it occurs naturally in you. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's naturally occurring, you need phosphorus to live, so when you go to the bathroom, it comes out Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, but it's being, it's not, in your lawn, unless you run soil test and submit that, that you need, which virtually nobody needs. Right. It's also, even in agriculture now, they're using low phosphorus fertilizers. It's been banned in detergents. And uh, <clears throat> really, we're stuck with wastewater right now. We've, we've done a lot for phosphorus because the lake's not on Cape Cod, but nationwide. So right now, there's these pilot systems, but boy, that's a lift because you don't really have to work. But people have to step up and test them uh, because when you get a certain number in place, 15. Yeah, no, no, they go general. Yeah. Oh, they go yeah, general. general. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. the nitrogen system that BCWC is, is installing here is being installed by a bunch of organizations in this region, trying to get to 50. Yeah. Because once you get to 50, then the cost drops, not just for production. But you don't have to go and test them, right. which costs thousands of dollars. So, so that's coming, but it doesn't do anything for phosphorus. The, the bottom line is you, you need to treat for phosphorus in yeah. the wastewater. And, and you know, there's, there's at, right now, there's sort of a limited universe of the ways you can do that. And, and there are certainly an even smaller number that are approved generally used kinds of strategies. That's why, you know, the town is really looking strongly at the sewer system. Because that's that's a way that can guarantee that it's not going to be there. See, can we go in and just replace all your leach fields? <laughs> Which is a horror, but that, that gives you a new flow path and you reset it back to the sewer system. Right? But that would be voluntary by the citizen, right? certainly by the town. Yeah. Is there a limit to how much the, the soils around the mine are going to attenuate phosphorus? I mean, do they get saturated at some point? I mean, can they go on forever? No. Well, I mean, that's why you get breakthrough. So the, that flow path from your leach field to the pond gets saturated with phosphorus. So there's no binding sites, and that's, that's why, you get the, why you get phosphorus going. So the is pond. that what happened in 2018? We reached that limit? Uh, it's it's a common since these ponds there's a lot of, there's a lot of variability around them. You got breakthrough, certainly got breakthrough. You had a number of conditions that created the situation where cyanobacteria were the the optimal kind of phytoplankton that you were going to get there. And yeah, for the Cape, people are thinking that that. We've had these houses, 1950 hardly had any houses around here, and over the last 70 years or so, that, that now we've had enough houses, and some of those are old enough, and now we're starting to see not just the Shubal Pond, but for all the ponds, we're starting to see breaking, and that's why we're seeing those blooms now. Yeah. 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 Y
if you look at, at the, the age of the houses that are here, most of them are, are 20 to 30 years, which is sort of corresponds to that phosphorus travel time. So that's why you're starting to see breakthrough showing up in a lot of the ponds, and you're starting to see phytoplankton blooms all over the place. Can, can you no. say something about the um, expansiveness of the cyanobacteria blooms? Does it, does it basically, in Jubal 1, does it go like cover most of the pond, the edges? Is it something that's happening like very intermittently, or is it something where people there are having to deal with it, like with the closed beach most of the time? Yeah, so in 2018, that was pretty expansive across the whole pond. Um, you know, that condition was across the whole pond. Uh, I don't know how long. I wasn't, I wasn't here in the town at that time. Um, and the data associated with it, I'm not sure. Um, you know, and it could have... It occurred in October at the end of the season, so I, I'm not sure how long that bloom was. Um, more of what I've been paying attention to since I got here in 2020 was how long our 2020 and 2021 blooms were. And those ones were patchier. So they, basically the cyanobacteria were concentrating generally closer to the shoreline in some cases due to wind-blown activities. So for instance, measurements in the middle of the pond may indicate you know, a different condition than if the wind's coming out of the south and you're standing on Willimantic Beach and the, the cyanobacteria have been concentrated to that side of the pond. So it, it is a bit spotty. And then when it blooms over there, is that something that like, it goes away in a week? Or is it something that's stuck around for like six weeks? Or well, in, oh, um, in, in the recent years relative to uh, the town cyanobacteria monitoring program, we monitor at multiple beaches around Shubal Pond. So what I can tell you is that in certain weeks, one beach would actually look better, but another one would be worse. So the pond was generating cyanobacteria from somewhere, and depending on generally what direction the wind was blowing, that's where you would see the scum lines start to develop on the pond. And yeah, they would clear up, but then it might be on the other side of the pond. So it, yeah, and they would be five, sometimes up to nine weeks long for a Shubal pond. That, that's part of the variability associated with how the wounds occur they're going to occur at various points depending on how the wind blows yeah. and how the oxygen levels are in the pond and all that. And wind is a key factor in terms of concentrating. I was monitoring, literally collecting and working with ABCC on uh, Mystic and Middle Pond yeah. mm -hmm. in Hamlet. And um, those ponds, the idiot out uh, there, you know, they'll, they'll get a bloom and then it goes away and it's right. like, I don't want to say no big deal, but it's like, okay, it happened there. And then, oh, like, you know, four weeks later, whoo, it's over there. Do you know what I mean? I, I know so exactly what you're I'm trying to get a, a handle on. Chubal, I'm thinking, had much worse, more frequent, right. longer term yeah. than the Indian Fox. Yes, because essentially every week they'd go out there and they'd continue to find it somewhere. Well, yeah. It, it's not the same. Over yeah, correct. Paula. You said that the, the pond actually is very successful at removing nitrogen when it comes through. I'm assuming that that same thing doesn't happen with phosphorus. It just collects and doesn't... Uh, it does collect in the pond and the sediments where there's oxygen in the water mm -hmm. column, those are aerobic sediments. They actually you know, pull phosphorus in because the, the iron and those sediments binds to the phosphorus and makes it unavailable. Um, but that's only in, when you're near the sediments, right? Um, just like in the, the you know, septic system plumes, that phosphorus binds to the iron bound in our, in our Cape Cod sands. It's nitrogen though, it doesn't bind to anything. It can be denitrified in specific areas like wetlands or the pond has its zones that removes nitrogen and stuff like that. But phosphorus, it is attenuated in the pond, um, but it's, it's not like nitrogen in the same way that it's attenuated. Pond, ponds are wetlands. Wetlands trap, hold and trap nutrients. That's what they do. Yeah. The difference is, is that phosphorus stays forever unless it can seep out the other side. Nitrogen, as Amberson has a gaseous form, 
phosphorus does not. If it did, it would be phosgene gas and above the deck. So you had it sends off N2, which is 78% of the atmosphere. So that's the difference between nitrogen and phosphorus. Other nitrogen and phosphorus issues with gravity above? Um. <sighs> Farming. People use fertilizer to generate crops. Um, most of the cranberry bugs that we've looked at and the farmers that run those are really responsible because they don't want to spend the extra money on the fertilizer. Um, occasionally, depending on when they release water, that can be an issue, but usually most of their releases of water are during the fall time when it's, it's not a problem for the, the water quality in the pond. Phosphorus and nitrogen coming out of cranberry bottles has been brought up since when I had totally black hair. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's not an issue. It's the, we've done the analysis multiple times in many, many bottles, and what we found is, is that it's equivalent, when they're fertilizing full freight, it's equivalent to two and a half acres only for those mansion. <laughs> okay? And so <clears throat> we don't have it. So it really is the issue. And now they don't even use it now. We've worked through the primary experiment station, which is also part of the NASA, and they've developed a low phosphorus fertilizer now. And they found even that primary owners are using no phosphorus. Because they found there's enough stuff in their sediments, just like in the pond sediments, that they can grow uh, the full crop without diminution of the yield without fertilizing phosphorus for a number of years. So that, that issue is gone. The nitrogen is usually low anyway. And, uh, and these are based on studies that go, you know, take samples every 15 minutes for the year. I and mean, they're not like somebody going out just like, doing it quick. Has there been a trout or, or mussel kill? No. No. Are you still stocking it? Uh, they will start stocking it again, I think, in early October. Because I remember on one of the slides, it looked like there was no room left for uh, the trout. I'm surprised they survived. Yeah, so trout are a what we call a put and take fishery. Um, they don't actually exist naturally in our ponds. The state actually grows them at trout raising fish farms and then trucks them to the pond uh, and then puts them in. And then you, fishermen, you know, fisherwomen, would go out and take them through fishing activities. So they do that in the spring, like usually starting March through May when there's the ha habitat available. And then by, um, through the summer, by June, they stop tr stocking the ponds. And then in the fall, they resume stocking again. Yeah, yeah they still seem to survive even though their area where they're no, okay is the they don't. What Amber was saying is they were replenishing the population of trout <laughs> twice a year. Okay. Yeah. Um, they are not, there is not, the, given the conditions in the pond with the dissolved oxygen, they're not going to survive through a whole year. Because there is an adequate oxygen so either they're, in their whole water. Either habitat. they're fish or they die. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're drinking in fossils. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So is, is there, is there a, um, somebody looking at the fauna in the pond and what's there? You know, are there, is there a natural population of some on the right? So, so what's, what's living in there? You, know? uh, you are correct. There is no outlet to Shubal Pond. It is a natural kettle hole pond. They uh, SMAS assessed the, the macrophyte coverage on the pond bottom using a video survey as well as muscle coverage. and. There are mussels and macrophytes proliferating around this pond in the areas above eight meters where there's enough oxygen. Um, plants are limited by the amount of light that gets to the bottom, so those areas uh, vary as well. But yes, there is a, a healthy mussel population in this pond at this time. Turtles? There's turtles in most yeah. ponds. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Excellent presentation, a lot of information. I'm still trying to work through it all in my head. Um, what I'm thinking about right now is the, um, the amount of phosphorus, phosphorus that's, that's in the pond at this point. And if, if I'm correct, um, phosphorus doesn't necessarily cause the algae blooms, but it fuels them. Is that kind of a correct statement? Uh, the 
sort of splitting hairs, but yeah. Okay, well anyways, I'm thinking of it in my head as a fuel source. Mm -hmm. So we have this phosphorus in the pond and it's not going anywhere. We have, it sounds like a massive amount of it. Um, I guess I'm just seeing this whole plan as a very long-term plan. Anytime at this point where the conditions are right for a bloom, we have the fuel there to initiate that. Um, the alum treatments, that's not going to remove phosphorus. That's going to capture it, essentially, and hold it. It's going to, it's going to take a part of that pie yep. that Amber showed. It's going to take out part of that pie. So um, that will lower the amount of available phosphorus in the pond. So hopefully that diminishes your opportunities for phytoplankton blooms. Right, when, when we're treating it for, with the alum. Right. And, but it's, if we ever stop that, that phosphorus, it's not, the alum's not breaking down the phosphorus and leaving the pond. So no. if the alum treatments were ever to stop, that fuel source kicks back up and we're back with a lot of fuel for the. Well, I guess you're going to have a situation, you're have so the pie diagram, there's a mount coming in from the watershed. Mm -hmm. There's an amount that's coming from the sevens. Right. That alum treatment, that the, the big the part that is coming from the watershed is, is the largest part of the pie. So the idea is that's what you got to deal with. That's right. what the town is in their long term strategy. They're going to try to tackle that big part of the pie. Mm -hmm. The little part of the pie, the sediments, the alum treatment is is they acknowledge it's a temporary sort of solution. Right, but. By dealing with that, hopefully you're lowering the overall amount of phosphorus that's in the water column, and that diminishes your opportunity that you're going to have an algal bloom and you're going to have poor water quality conditions. It sort of puts a stop on the on the worsening conditions. Right. And is that something that'll have to be treated every five years, ten years, fifty years? Or that is that is the debate at this point. <laughs> That's the we're planning on every three to five years. Three five years. But, but, we, but we're going to monitor it. Yes. During that time frame, so we'll let the science tell us what we need. So, alum, alum binds to the phosphorus. Right. So, alum is short for aluminum. And iron also binds to phosphorus. Iron is naturally occurring in the pond at this time. And under oxygenated conditions, iron and phosphorus bind together, which makes it unavailable to cyanobacteria, even though it might still be there in the sediments. When we lose oxygen at the bottom of the pond, the iron breaks away from the phosphorus, and now it's available to the cyanobacteria to use. Mm -hmm. Iron is uh, one of the elements on our periodic table, if any of you are familiar with chemistry. Alum, aluminum, is also on the periodic table. Alum will also bind to phosphorus, but it stays bound even under low oxygen conditions. In which case, even if we have low oxygen at the b below eight meters in the summertime, the aluminum and the phosphorus will stay bound, keeping it unavailable to the cyanobacteria. And yes, it is essentially a band-aid you know, right. you're, you're basically putting a cap on the sediments and saying, stay there, don't be released. Right. But if you keep adding nutrients to the pond through septic systems, storm water, you know, any source, that is going to continue to add phosphorus to the pond that's not bound to alum and can then someday become available at concentrations high enough to promote cyanobacteria blooms. So, what's, yeah, what's going on is that we have the alum that locks the sediment up, that's done. There's no natural condition that you will pond or any other pond on the cave will break that bond. Okay, it's done. If you add more stuff on top, you'll bind some of that too. But think about it. When all it's down here, you're starting to organic on it. It's really the organic, the pine can and everything so. And they build up. That pond's, the bottom is filling in. And we've got a couple of millimeters a year. But you get two millimeters a year, and in 10 years, that's 20 millimeters, and that's millimeters, which is almost an inch on top of this alum. So there's no way for the alum to interact with the top of that. So really what happens is you don't stop, as Amber said, you don't stop the input and the growth of plankton and settling that plankton, then you bury the alum. It's not that the alum stops working, it's just it's buried it away. 
And that happens everywhere. I mean, our estuaries are filling in, our ponds are filling in. They're only filling a little bit. Okay. You dredge the bottom of the pond? Yeah, tremendous <laughs> kind of expense. You could do that. No, no you could. No, I mean, that's on the we, we traditionally, options to deal with sediments include looking at alum, doing aeration, increasing the amount of oxygen so it binds up the phosphorus, or dredging. Right. Now, dredging typically comes in millions of dollars, hundreds times what it costs to do an alum treatment. So, dredging just doesn't generally get on the list of and I, I have to, this is in my contract. <laughs> Say every time this trade comes up. You dredge estuaries for navigation, fine, that's good. But if you dredge a pond, the same thing happens with the alum. You don't stop the sources, the stuff falls on the bottom, and in four or five years you're back to where you were It's now you create a new bottom, it's deeper, but it's a new bottom. So you haven't stopped the problem. The problem is the sewering, the stormwater. So it's watershed, that's the only way you can do a long, long term. Well, the dredging is also extremely regulatorily challenging. Yeah. To get yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> they did 149 no pond. That, that's talked about dredging. But let me ask the question about bubbles pond. Did it have bubblers in it at one point? No. So, Correct, yeah. Correct. Give us the history of why we don't do that anymore. I don't know. Uh, I just go by and notice them. No, I mean, this, this, the, traditionally, when we talked to, talk to towns about pond management strategies for dealing with their sediments, um, they talk about, they, the reason they gravitate towards alum is they don't need to have any sort of maintenance on it. They don't need to have any energy costs associated with it. If you do aeration, it's got all of those things. So you have to have staff that go out and make sure that it runs the right way. You've got to turn it on and off. You've got to make sure that all of the equipment stays and works the right way. Um, so it becomes a little bit more of a challenge. Um, but then you throw in the management side of things. If you don't do the, the timing of the aeration, turning it on and off at the right time, then you create a situation that's actually worse because you're stirring up all that bottom water and with it all of the phosphorus and it can get up into the rest of the water column. And in your Morrison's Mills pond down the street here, that's dredging because the pond is filled in. It's nothing to do with the phosphorus removal. It has to do with deepening the pond the way it used to be so that it will trap more of the nitrogen coming down the river before it gets to, say, to the bay to help improve the land. Any more questions? Um, I have a question about testing. Do you, um, you send your tests, like water quality tests, do you do that at DPW or do they go to the county lab? Uh, well, we do both. So um, as part of this effort, really the, the comprehensive holistic look at Shubal Pond, SMAS conducted all of the monitoring in the pond. Um, but we also have the Ponds and Lakes Stewardship Program, which every fall, right, right around this time actually, we go out to like 40 ponds across town and we collect water quality samples uh, in the middle, deepest portion of the pond. So you go to the deep port, the, the site that's right over the deepest section of the pond and you collect water quality samples at multiple depths to track, you know, over time how conditions in the pond have been changing. Um, and then we are also doing that in the spring now. Uh, in April, we conduct that effort as well. So it's, it's both, to answer your question. All of the house samples for the last 20 years, 21 years, have been run by the same analytical facility as SMAPs for free for the towns and for the snapshot. Actually, that's what they were able Most of the pond work on the cables, but those have been run for And most of the estuary work in terms of that. It's a huge analytical facility. It runs tens of thousands of samples. And it's a uh, deals with DP and EPA and why it's done. I wanted to ask, um, this year the pond has been open for swimming most of the summer. Is that because of the drought changing the way the water or is there no explanation for this? Um, I, I mean... Well, I, don't, I don't know what <laughs> testing has been done this summer, so I, yeah. I 
Yes, I mean, the dynamics at which there is not enough phosphorus to contribute to the, the cyanobacteria blooms we've been experiencing. I think one thing you'll notice over every summer is the time at which Shubal Pond experiences a cyanobacteria bloom is a bit variable. And I think some, a lot of that has to do with the residence time of you know, how long, like when a parcel of water enters Shubal Pond, how long is it in the pond? How much additional you know, phosphorus is entering the pond either from sediment interactions, um, you know, septic system inputs, stormwater inputs each year to affect the phosphorus that's available in the pond. Plus, um, plus you get all of the natural, surrounding natural variabilities. So if you have lots of wind, if you have a particularly windy summer, the water column stays mixed and you are less likely to have algal blooms. Right. Um, but Amber is right, we're in, a, we're in a drought. So the volume of the pond is smaller, which causes the concentrations to rise. So you've got all of these dynamics occurring at the same time, but you may dodge it. It just, it's just a question of how it goes. Well, and we, we also don't know if it's promoting um, just green algae you know, versus cyanobacteria, because you can still, the total of phytoplankton, right, which includes cyanobacteria, it can be, you, know, you can have you know, more of the green good algae in there than cyanobacteria right now, which is good because you can swim in that. You know, um, we'd have to be looking at water quick clarity right now to see if that's been diminished over the course of the summer and actually assess the pond for those phytoplankton concentrations to assess whether or not it's, you know, you know there's an effect of the phosphorus available to the phytoplanktons. Um, at this time, we have seen, you know, a little bit of scum, very, very faint, uh, appearing on the, the shoreline, but most of it's actually green algae this year. So. So it, the phosphorus is still available, it's just not cyanobacteria getting to it first. I mean, you've got about a month and a half worth of time left that you could get into a, a bigger algorithm. Yeah. But it all depends on how all of those variabilities shake out. Sure. Are short-term fixes, are there dates for this to be yeah, so um, actually we, for both the alum treatment and the stormwater inputs, we plan to have that on the town council's next agenda so that they can um, give it a first read and then vote on it in late September to appropriate the funds to do this work. In which case we would hope that in 2023 we actually implement these solutions, assuming it gets funded. That's correct. We so as I mentioned. Um, yeah. So as I mentioned, this pipe here is associated with the Evergreen Drive, and they're currently working over there on improving the drainage uh, leaching structures. Um, associated with the catch basins on Evergreen Drive. They are also going to go to Willimantic Drive and there's existing catch basins already along the roadway but they're old and they don't have very much leaching associated with them so they're going to improve and increase the amount of leaching associated with those basins. And I think add a couple more closer to the pond um, but you can only get so close because then you start interacting with the groundwater at the bottom and they don't become as effective in that. Yeah, the intent is to reduce how much stormwater is going down the boat ramp. Right now, the existing systems are better there, aren't functioning as well as they should, so we need to replace that infrastructure so that it can capture as much of the stormwater as possible. Well, there's two drainage um, catch bases mm -hmm. at the Bend and Little Man, right? right? And those have a direct pipe that goes into the pond. Yeah. Which is got a lot of stuff going into the pond, at least it's filled its own little mark. So, um, is that going to be changed? Well, actually, now that we're aware we have an easement to that catch basin in the pipe, the town does, we can do something about it. Um, up until like literally two weeks ago, I stumbled across this easement for that catch basin. Um, we thought it was completely private road, 
in which case it wasn't our responsibility and we, can't, we don't work on private roads. Um, so we, we had left it there. But now that we, we've identified that it's something we can work on because we have the easement to do so, it's on our radar. Um, that, decades ago, they put drainage in on the back side of the Willamette Drive, and the gravel that's been thrown back there has completely closed off all the drains except for one. This one little guy who's still trying as hard as he can <laughs> stop the water, but the yeah. other ones are useless at the moment. Oh, yeah. Hmm. On the, the private section of road? Or? That was the part they were going to pay years ago, and they put the complete drainage system in. Oh, wow. It was the same year that they paid the Sandy Shores. I don't remember what the year it was, but it's been a long time. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. you can find them all with one of those little things that finds another other things, because the grates are in it. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>